So it is time for council initiated discussion. We do this at every council meeting. I think you're all veterans of this. And this is an opportunity for you to ask for reports, either about our research programs and projects that are supported by NHGRI, or perhaps other more global uh, issues, such as the report we heard from Mike Lauer today that came out of council initiated discussion. Um, we also view you as representatives of the research community. And if there are issues or problems bubbling in the field, can't imagine in an era of COVID that there'd be any problems in biomedical research, but we're happy, happy to get uh, feedback from you about that. And Sharon, I see your hand is up. Well, I do think by the February report, since you just brought it up, I think it would be good to maybe have a dedicated presentation on sort of impacts on COVID um, and, and across the major consortia and just the two I'm involved with, for example, ClinGen hasn't had much of an impact because almost everything we do is virtual. Caesars had a very significant impact because we're doing a clinical trial. So it might be good to sort of hear you know, sort of across our large consortia, what the major impacts were. The other thing that struck me, uh, Rudy, when you did the introductions this morning, was the very large number of program analysts. I actually find it very interesting. They were all or almost all women. And it leads me to think that really there are a lot of men out there that are missing out on great jobs. But I don't know that we all really understand sort of how the extramural program, we know about the divisions, but sort of just the layers of employees and what their general jobs are, I think might be actually really informative to council and you know an open session to sort of the, the broader community. Okay, we can, <clears throat> internally we can uh, discuss that. We'll, we'll try to come up with something more imaginative than just having you look at organizational charts. Um, but yeah, how uh, labors and activities are uh, distributed uh, among the different divisions. We can work something up. Uh, sorry, uh, Hal Dietz and then Jonathan Haynes. Uh, so Rudy, um, I second um, Sharon's uh, suggestion that we should hear more about the impact of COVID. Um, I, I hear a lot of anxiety um, from young investigators about um, the impact that this has had on their productivity and um, how that will be reflected in their performance um, in review at NIH for renewal. Um, and uh, especially from uh, women junior investigators who have a disproportionate additional burden of um, handling uh, you know, teaching from home for their kids. And um, <clears throat> I really think it's, uh, it's something that we need to uh, understand and uh, potentially to address um, in a very directed way. So uh, I, I think that there needs to be some formal mechanism for, uh, for assessment. So Al, can I, uh, can I just inject, I, these are great topics, but I, would caution us that what I heard Sharon ask for were very specific to NHGRI programs, especially big consortium and some of the examples that she gave, whereas what you just asked for would certainly not be specific to NHGRI. It would be very relevant NIH-wide. I'm not saying, not saying we can't try to do both, although I would imagine that might be harder for us to get our hands around because I think NIH is just in the process of trying to get its hands around and, and ears and eyes and brains around the scope of the problem and how to address it. Yeah. So that would have to be two different, I mean, you know, they're related presentations, but it seems like we just got asked for two very different things. I just wanna make sure you agree with that. I, I agree that they are very different. I agree okay. that it is a broader problem, um, but I also would stress that if uh, the sense is that NIH as a whole is not um, taking an aggressive, uh, a sufficiently aggressive stance that um, NHGRI should instigate um, or, you know, survey uh, their own um, young investigators. Yeah. 
So just to reemphasize the point that Eric made, if your concern here, and, I, and it's totally legitimate, what will happen when applications come back in for renewal and progress is judged, that's all taking place. Not the vast majority of that is taking place in the Center for Scientific Review in um, uh, standing study sections, and we have no input or influence on that. The consortia, on the other hand, are almost always reviewed internally. And so that's a different story. Uh, I, think, I certainly think we can try to talk about each. I mean, there's a side of me that says that we are poised, uh, our, our program directors are poised to probably give some sort of an assessment what's happening with NHGRI programs. When I think about what Hal just asked, it's almost a side of me that says we should bring Mike Lauer back. I mean, it's that kind of a person that might be needed to be given a very high level how is NIH holistically thinking about this uh, and adjusting policies and routines to address this very obvious and real set of issues? Right. We'll, we'll give it some thought. How I mean, we'll we'll update you the best we can, and I'm I'm sure we'll know more in February, and I'm sure there'll be a lot we still don't know in February. Do institutes have the prerogative of changing the timeline for review for giving extensions? Uh, I, I don't know how to what extent each institute has the ability to address the situation individually. If it's in there, if the activity is in their review branch, they have total control over that. But again, the standing study sections are run by CSR. No, but I've seen talk about trying to give junior faculty like an extra year on an existing grant. Yep. Oh, um, yeah. and that kind granting, of thing. Granting an extension you're talking yes. about. That's, that's yes. what I'm suggesting. Yes, there, there we have control. I thought you were talking about when the peer review was scheduled. Yes, we can grant extensions. But we also saw last spring that OER acted very quickly to extend receipt dates, to change the policy on when preliminary data can be submitted and how much preliminary data was required. So there were quick actions that were taken on things that were relatively simple to adjust that was NIH wide. Yeah, I mean, but that was when COVID was an acute, um, largely unknown right. problem. Now it's the new normal. And I, I just wanna make sure that um, a, a degree of urgency and consideration is maintained. Um, okay. But, you know, building building on, on what Hal was saying, you know, my guess is that if NIH is going to do something, they'll ask each institute to give them data, which means you have to get the data together anyway. So why not start now in determining what investigators at all the different grant levels are at what you would consider to be at risk and then defining at risk is up to you uh, of impact of COVID-19. And then you can get an idea of how many people are really involved or how many grant recipients are, are involved at the different levels. And that will maybe even help you prepare for what may be coming down the road, um, just as a, as a way of thinking through what Hal was sort of proposing. Yeah. Keep in mind, this is not unrelated. In fact, it's completely related to one of the things I updated you on in my director's report related to um, uh, uh, restoration funding or whatever, a special relief package, whatever you want to call it that Congress is considering, which would be augmentation funds for NIH to help deal with these very issues. Obviously, if we extend, if we extend people because of the problems they had because of the pandemic, that's not going to be very helpful if we have to use funds that otherwise we're going to go to new grantees or other grantees. The whole idea is we need restoration funds to sort of help us get over this very awkward period. I am quite certain that if those funds are forthcoming, I don't know, and that's an if, but if they're forthcoming, it will come with a whole set of stipulations on how NIH is going to handle this corporately. And I don't think any institute could just run with their money any which way they want. There'll probably be some flexibilities, but I expect there's going to be a lot of discussion at the NIH level. We just haven't had those discussions because it's not entirely clear we're going to get such money. There's hope there's going to get that money, but as you know, it's all tied up in congressional deliberations and politics, which are very complicated at the moment. So would, would, you have, would you have an idea at some point of how much money you would need so that if the money comes in, 
whatever that NIH gives you, you actually are covered. And if it doesn't come in, you know, you're sort of screwed, but you know, where does the money come from? Well, I mean, that, that's the, the really hard question is if no additional money comes in. I mean, I, I think your question is, do we really know um, the extent of money that is needed? Obviously, we, the, the short answer is we don't. I, I mean, I'll ask a provocative question. You, you are all funded investigators. Do you, at this moment in time, have a full feel for your laboratory program, what the financial impact truly is? And if you were going to tomorrow ask NIH what was needed to get you back in some reasonable shape, but but be realistic about it, could you articulate those numbers? I, I mean, I'm actually asking. I don't know if you yet know the full implications. So in but fact, our school, of medicine, our school of medicine dean asks every laboratory PI for that information. Yeah, I would just yeah. echo the yeah. phrase "the new normal." Um, I think many of us feel like we're now in a period of whatever the However, however much our lab is open, I think most of us think we're probably there for quite a while. That we're not seeing these drastic changes in policy week to week. Similarly with clinical research, you know, switching to telemedicine and sent by phone and like that stuff's all sort of happened and we were probably there for a long time. So I do think this might be a good time to sort of pin people on what is this doing to your level of productivity, given you know the new normal sort of comp, uh, discussion, I think it's it's even used. Uh, th this is helpful to know because, to be honest, with at least for me, I, I don't know if my all my program directors agree with this. Maybe they have more insights than I do. I I just wasn't it wasn't entirely clear to me how well the extramural grantees would be in a position to, to be able to describe to us exactly what they need or whether they still are in a, a state of a lot of turbulence where they can't quite, I mean, obviously they need money, they know that, but can you really define it at some level of specificity? Because obviously, and obviously the problem is if you can always highball, you know, always come way high, but of course, if you do that, and then I, you know, that's gonna be a hopeless situation for NIH. So we really need to have some reasonably accurate assessment of what's gonna be needed. You know, so uh, as an example, we're locked in right now for the foreseeable future at 30% of census. Um, our animal colony is going to take at least another six months to get back to full swing. Um, clinical trial efforts are at a complete standstill, um, just non-existent. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that there is a, a, a new normal that has declared itself. Um, and I also worry about the COVID fatigue that comes along with the new normal mentality that, um, you know, the, the quick efforts to try to intervene and to help, um, I, I think some of that incentive has waned as there's lots and lots of competing interests. Um, so uh, I, I do think it should be a topic on all of our minds. Well, there's also a side of me, to be honest with you, that thinks, depending upon how the dominoes fall, you know, February may be too late to wait. I mean, we may not be able to afford it the next council meeting. So what I, what I might tell council members is that if dominoes start to fall in a positive way and that maybe we're getting money and we need input, we may be calling on you for some, you know, offline conversations or we'll convene some sort of a, of interaction to get input. I mean, because again, at the moment it is a, a little bit of a hurry up and wait. We're not poised, I don't think, to sort of know definitively what we're doing quite yet, but you're making good points that maybe we could be some collecting some data. And the second we get a sense that that's going to be really important data, maybe we want to be touching base with you again to try to get input for you to guide what, what kind of questions we ask and how we get those answers. A okay. helpful conversation. Jonathan, you had your hand up, but you've taken it down. Did we wear you out or? <laughs> Partly, but then mostly what I was going to say has now been has now been pretty much said. I was going to go back to Sharon's original point and say it's not just impact, it's what can be done. And we, we've sort of talked about that. But I, I, now, now that I, I have the floor, um, something, another, another point is it's not just money. I mean, if I have a project that is just 
COVID is just not going to let me make much progress. What do I do with that? Another year of funding to not be able to make progress is a problem. So what, I mean, can I suspend the grant for two years? And, you know, I mean, what else besides money, I think, uh, might be might be something. There may be other ways of, of, of looking at things. Okay. Wendy Chung has had her hand up for quite a while. Go ahead, Wendy. So I'm just going to pile on to the COVID theme, um, but highlight a couple things. So some of us and some programs that have tried to increase diversity just appreciate that those trainees and those individuals, I think, have been hardest hit by this. So in addition to who Hal mentioned in terms of those who are caring for children, it's also those who are caring for the elderly who financially uh, have difficulties who, for instance, in New York, take public transportation those who are disabled and have health risks and are concerned especially about things are even paralyzed and dis, um, affected even more, more severely. Um, just what Hal said, but I wanna just highlight it, clinical trials have either been ground to a halt or those that were midstream where we continued to, for instance, dispense medications from home, um, the validity of those findings are very much in question for many things. And, with this, um, even those that didn't have an intervention, but what we looked at, for instance, genomic medicine and what people had in terms of anxiety or depression, even those outcome measures, because they were collected during COVID situation, are so much affected by everything else that was going on around. Again, um, how we're going to use those data, I think, are very much in question at this point. Um, this has resulted in at least what I've seen, and we'll be talking about it at Global Genes later this week, the rare disease community in particular is just extremely hostile, is the word I'll use, in terms of what's happened to, for many of the rare diseases, very little funds that they had initially to invest, and then feeling as if they've lost their investment when they did invest in clinical trials with those clinical trials data going away, many of the research being suspended, um, many of the, again, shutting down colonies, shutting down experiments, not being able to get back either that time or money. And for many of them that really feel like they're racing against time um, for certain degenerative disorders, as I said, there really is a sense of hostility now in the rare disease community. I don't know what to do about it, except that people have thought about for instance, even a distributed model where there might be cores or things in different parts of the country uh, that, for instance, if we had to do science almost in a CRO type of way, uh, where things where there were safe spots where things could be done based on what the epidemiology of the virus is at the time, I don't know that that's the answer that's sustainable, but there is this sense of desperation out there for many communities. And um, we're, we're struggling to be able to be responsive and deal with it because we consider them our partners and we're as desperate as they are. But, but there is, like I said, this almost sense of hostility at this point. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Other comments on this topic or other issues to bring to our attention? Any reports of our research programs that you'd like to hear? One other comment I would make, Rudy, I would I would point out to council, I I so much want council members to meet some of these new institute directors, five new ones coming in in the next few months. I still haven't gotten Ned Sharpless here from NCI. Council was asking for that about two years ago. I, you know, based on the previous discussion we just had, there just seems to be so much more urgent issues. And especially as we have these things virtually, we just can't do 10 hour days the way we sometimes do what we do in person. So. You know, I'm just sort of going to hold off for now, inviting some of these new folks. But if any of you have very strong feelings that you would love to hear from some of these new directors as they arrive, um, uh, you know, let, let me know, and we'll, 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 Rudy and I will figure it out. But at least for now, we're just trying to. I, I would also tell you similarly. You know, we have some things going on that within the institute and in our intramural program. You're overdue for an update. What's going on intramurally? There's other things going on. We want to tell you about. We really are just being very uh, mindful of, of uh, Zoom fatigue. And so we're trying to keep these open sessions uh, as, as felt as we can. So we're just accumulating a list of, but of things to bring to you. On the other hand, if this is the new normal, if we're still doing this a year from now, I don't want to not have you introduced to some things we want to tell you about. So we'll just have to figure out what's the right way to balance all of these things. So if I could, you know, I, to me, it seems like 
again, you can be strategic about which institute directors to bring in. You know, one way of thinking strategically is which one has, which institute directors have the money that you'd like to get access to and bring them in first. Uh, another would be what, who are the new institute directors that might get a nice uh, package of money to be an institute director cause God knows who else wants to do it, but that maybe not know enough not to make a deal with you. So, I mean, it's just a whole series of things that one could, uh, you're right. Good thing about. Oh, I can tell you, some of them have some considerable intellectual over, you know, bear a lot of interest, both their own and what they want to move their institutes towards. That would be of great interest to this council, some more than others. So, yeah, if we start bringing them through, we will do it in a strategic way. You know, like Lindsay Criswell has been doing genetics of lupus and RA forever. And so, I mean, she'd be I, I, one I think would be a good partner. She'd be great. Michael Chang, the new head of the I Institute, is a very, I mean, he's one of the, incredibly intense data scientist expertise. So he, he'll bring some things that are, and including the use of electronic health records for, for doing analyses. There's some great overlap with things we're talking about. And I'll just warn you that we have a very large number of RFA and grants coming to February council. So we'll have a, a much bigger uh, expanded closed session. And it's just a time competition. Okay, certainly stuff for us to chew on there. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna bring this council initiated discussion to close. The last thing we have to do in open session is for me to read you the conflict of interest statement. And uh, this applies to all the grant applications that you'll be re reviewing in the closed session tomorrow. Uh, you must leave the room when applications submitted by your own organization are being individually discussed. In the case of state higher education or other systems with multiple campuses that are geographically separated, own organization is intended to mean the entire system, except where a determination has been made that the components are separate organizations for the purpose of determining conflict of interest. You should avoid situations that could give rise to charges of conflict of interest, whether real or apparent. For example, you should not participate in the deliberations and actions on any application from or involving your spouse, child, a recent student, recent teacher, professional collaborator with whom you have worked closely, a close personal friend, or a scientist with whom you have had longstanding scientific or personal differences. NHGRI staff will determine the appropriate action based on recency, frequency, and strengths of such associations or interests, either positive or negative, and will instruct you accordingly. In the council actions in which you vote on a block of applications without discussing any individual one, the on block action being one such example, your vote will not apply to any application from any institution fulfilling the criteria noted above. Please sign the conflict of interest and disposal of confidential materials form that Comfort Brown has sent to you and return it to Comfort with your signature by email, please. So this concludes the open session of the council meeting. I'll just wait a few seconds to see if anyone has any parting words or last questions or anything from Eric. Otherwise, uh, we will meet again tomorrow at noon in closed session to discuss applications. And Eric, you can gavel us to closure. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.